Okay. Oh, oh. Hello, and welcome to an exciting Solve for X Moonshot Moonshot. Moonshot Moonshot. We are here with some awesome, awesome people who are doing excellent work in electronics, learning, moonshots, fabrication, invention, all this crazy stuff. We're going to introduce them right now. Uh, I'm Lady Ada, the uh, engineer, and I'm going to just be hosting this thing. We also have Aya from Little Bits. Say hi. Hi. Hey. <laughs> you can tell it's Aya from Little Bits because of the lovely Little Bits, Little Bits sign behind you. And uh, we also have Catherine. Hey. Hey, who is coming to us from Stanford, where she does Fuse Box. And we also have uh, Tracy, who's just hanging out, chilling. She's got like a really nice backyard, or front yard. <laughs> Very jealous we don't have that here in New York. I have like a concrete slab. Um, so we're going to talk for like about, you know, half an hour or so about what we do, uh, our, our moonshot passion, how we're moonshotting our moonshot, and uh, what you, the audience, can do to get us on that rocket ship and take off into the sky. Um, okay, so let's like do some quick like intros, intros. So Aya, what the heck is Little Bits and what do you do? So Little Bits is a library of electronics, electronic modules that snap together with magnets and they each have one function like light and sound and sensors and motors and they snap together with magnets so you can make very complex circuits literally with no engineering knowledge or programming whatsoever. Um, and our moonshot is to try to get the entire world uh, independent of age, of uh, technical background, uh, of gender, uh, to understand electronics and learn about how important technology is, but also even more importantly to invent with electronics. Um, and make their own products or interactions uh, or, uh, or inventions, make them happen. And you're, you're like an MIT trained engineer, so you're taking all the knowledge that you know about electrical engineering and computer science, and you're bringing that into these snap together blocks, and they look like deceptively simple, right? They're like little, they look a little bit like Legos. I know they're not Legos, but they look a little bit like, you know, snap together pieces. But they're actually incredibly complicated, right? Can you, can you just grab a couple of these little blocks that you have? Sure. So, so we intentionally work very hard to try to make little bits uh, feel simple and feel unintimidating. Um, and so a very simple example, I have a power bit here, I have an LED bit here, and I can snap them together and make a light go on. But then I can separate them, put this sensor in between, and then suddenly I have a pressure sensitive circuit. This is quite simple, but then when you start to pair it with things that are more complicated, in this case, I have a number bit that you can visualize sensor data with. Um, we have a microphone that's essentially digitizing audio signals. Um, we have uh, a speaker or wireless modules that can do wireless communication. And all the while, even though they're very complex circuits, they have computers, they have firmware, um, uh, they have uh, quite a bit of circuitry on them, we try to do um, work very hard to make them appear simple so that anyone feels uh, comfortable to just grab them and start to make their own projects. Do you, do you need to know how to program or code or anything to use little bits? No, you can literally get within seconds. There's a color code, so blue is power, pink is input, green is output. That's all you need to know. Um, and But if you wanted to start to program, we're uh, launching programmable modules next month, actually, so that you could take it as complex as you want, but you don't need it. How, how young are some of the, the young girls and boys that you've seen play with little bits? I've seen you at workshops playing with a bunch of kids, showing them electronics. Uh, what's the age range for people using little bits? We say on the box ages 8 and up because they're small parts and they have magnets, but actually we get email uh, from people with uh, kids as young as 2 and 3 and they send us pictures of their kids and they love it because of the immediacy and the simplicity and because they're colorful and playful. Uh, but we also see ages going all the way up to you know 90s and, and more because people who are retired engineers um, or, or senior citizens want to play with their, with their children or sometimes in between you know students uh, want to use them for prototyping uh, a new product for university, for example. Yeah, it's, it's amazingly, um, it's so simple but so sophisticated. And that's actually really hard because there's a lot of other, you know, like 
you know, we, when we were younger, had the, the snap together, like Radio Shack, 5001 project kits, but they're actually really complicated to use. But what I really like about Little Bits is how simple you made it. Um, so your moonshot mission is to get everybody to learn engineering. What, what, how does Little Bits fit into your vision? Our moonshot is to really help fuel uh, this hardware renaissance and really try to expand it outside the choir so that it, it's not engineers um, that are really using electronics creatively and to invent the future, but that it's kids and designers and students and artists uh, and people that would usually be afraid of technology and electronics, that they would feel really empowered and inspired uh, to make anything from a mock-up of a new product to uh, an art installation that's interactive uh, to sometimes a, a full learning them for STEM and STEAM uh, and anything in between. Yeah, I remember when you were starting Little Bits at iBeam, and I remember you were thinking about Little Bits as like a designer tool for industrial designers. So it's kind of cool that you designed something and you're like, this is really great for industrial designers, but wait a minute, it's so simple, even like a child can use it to make electronic devices. So it's, it's kind of cool how you kind of pivoted your view from, and that maybe you were always thinking about having it be educational, but it, it fulfilled this goal that you had that maybe wasn't the original goal. It was actually kind of accidental. Uh, the first time I noticed that Little Bits would be interesting for, for kids um, and would work for kids was at Maker Fair in 2009. It was the first time I showed it as a fully functional uh, product at Maker Fair. Um, and for me, it was for makers and designers. It, it really was focused for, uh, on industrial design, prototyping, sketching, uh, ideation, uh, iterate, iteration. Uh, but then suddenly hordes of kids started to hang out at the booth and make things and they would make things blink and then they would ask questions. How does this work and why does the current go this way and whatever. Suddenly I realized that there was an opportunity to really help um, improve education at a very early level. So we still now balance very, um, we, we try to keep a balance of our focus on designers and adults and professionals as well as on kids. And it's, it's, a, it's a constant uh, push and pull, I guess. Yeah, you want to keep it interesting and, and exciting, but not too difficult. Okay, that's a really good introduction to a little bit. Now we're going to go to Catherine, who hopefully has not fallen asleep. <laughs> okay, you're nope. still there. Great. You're live. Tell us about what you do. I heard you're doing makerspace stuff. You're doing research in biotech. What's going on? Yeah, um, so I'm a Stanford freshman, um, and I actually work with a group called Fusebox. So what we actually do is we started out with a group and we were asking, you know, how can we bring hacker spaces, you know, which are so plentiful in the San Francisco area, so common on the Stanford campus, how can we put those in the hands of students who not only have no access to hacker spaces and cannot afford those, but actually have no idea what that is. Right. Um, and we have very little way otherwise of finding out. Um, and because one of the things that we really have noticed, even I think about the Bay Area, is that there can be a huge disparity mm -hmm. uh, in terms of what people have access to. And, you know, we would have high schools where students have been working with Arduinos and, um, you know, other electronics since age five. And then, um, you know, just across the bay or, or very close to them, students who had very little access to that had never heard of that before. And many of them almost never would. Right. Um, so we really wanted, so we started out thinking, you know, how can we bring hacker spaces into schools? Um, and we quickly realized that that can be somewhat difficult. It can be hard to work with schools. Um, so our new goal, um, and one that we're really pouring ourselves into right now, is how can we actually bring that hacker space experience directly to those students, rather mm -hmm. than making it so that the students have to go anywhere else. Um, so Fusebox is actually a mobile hacker space project. Um, we are a team of five Stanford students right now. Uh, we are working to acquire a truck. Um, and we're going to be filling it with Arduinos and lights and all kinds of other cool stuff. Um, and we're going to be driving those classes to teach coding um, and making directly to those kids. So we're really excited about it. Um, we ran our first, uh, what's called a Stanford Splash class. So we taught 50 different students how to work with Arduinos um, for the first time. And they had a blast. We had a blast. Um, and so we're actually going to be, I know I said that she debuted at Maker Faire. So we will also be um, debuting at the Maker Faire um, this year in the Bay Area, and we're really excited about that. Yeah, this is interesting because, you know, what what's interesting is that no matter what, uh, you know, how much money your family has, chances are you have access to a cell phone. Almost everybody has a cell phone now, or you're using computer or tablets. This right. high-tech stuff is everywhere, and right. yet most people and most kids don't know what's in them, right? Right. You, you can hear, like, oh, well, there's a microprocessor, an accelerometer in your phone, but like, what does that really mean? What what can an accelerometer do? 
And a lot of this uh, sensor technology is available even in things as simple as little bits. But if the kid isn't exposed to it, if they don't see it, and oftentimes they're not going to see it in school because the school system is just, it's a little slow. It just takes right. time for, I mean, I don't doubt that in 10 years, like, every kid is going to have an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi in, in class. It's going to be a class. Mm -hmm. But you want to reach kids now uh, right. while you can. So having, like, a, you know, you're going to have, like, an RV or something? Like, what, what is it, like, a big truck or? Yeah, so. Yep, we're going to be, uh, we're looking to be in a delivery truck right now. Um, we're going to, you know, load it up with everything that we have, drive over. Um, and what we've noticed from other projects that work with Stanford that drive trucks filled with, you know, with anything, with classes, to the areas that there's really this kind of excitement behind seeing a big truck pull up, having kids jump out, and really looking in the back and seeing, um, you know, seeing everything that they have to bring. Uh, but more than that, what we noticed at our one thing that was really cool that we noticed at our last splash class is that just like you said, you know, people ha have so much technology and it's so advanced, um, and they really have no idea what's inside it. So uh, we did a few demos, and one of them was working with just a very simple tilt sensor and a very simple accelerometer. Um, and we had kids look at that, and they, you know, they'd never seen this before, and they they had no idea what it was. And when they saw it tilt. You know, there's that connection. They're like, "That's what's in our phone." Yeah, that's, that's how it knows. Phone. You know, you tilt, you tilt your tablet or your phone, and it. How does it know how well you're holding it uh, by using an accelerometer? Right. And and it's cool because these these sensors used to be um, like uh, thirty, forty dollars. Wait, right. I'm gonna bring like the moonshot thing. They were like NASA technology, space technology, <laughs> moonshot technology. <laughs> but now. You can get an accelerometer for like 50 cents because they're in everything, right? They're so mass manufactured that all these technologies, and you know, even an Arduino board or Arduino compatible, right. you can get a microcontroller board that works with almost any computer for like 10 bucks, 20 bucks, super, super cheap compared to how it was when I was in high school, which was like pretty terrifying in comparison. <laughs> it was like 60 or 70 dollars just to get started, right? And you, you have to hope you wouldn't break it because you broke it, like the whole thing was destroyed. Now it's like much more durable, lower cost technologies, and you know you can even get them in some Radio Shacks or right. other hobby shops, which is really cool. Like Radio Shack does like a DIY thing, so you can go and, and get parts uh, at a mm -hmm. hobby store. And it's interesting to hear how you're going about it with a sort of mobile um, truck, and how that relates to pro programs like First. Like you probably did First, right, or something similar. Right. Yeah, I was well aware of First and um, did participate and had a lot of friends in First. Um, and one thing that you know, actually, all of the people that I'm working with right now, we we are at Stanford and we had access. I mean, you know, we were well aware of programs like that that were available. And you know, I think one thing that we were really conscious of is that often there is there is some sort of divide in who knows about a program like First, who gets involved in a program like First. Um, and we really wanted to, you know, to bridge that gap. I think they're making huge advances in saying, you know, this is I really like first, but I want, I want more programs. I want, like, wearable right. first. And I want, right. like, a little bit. Like, there should be multiple programs. Because, like, for example, like, I'm not really into robotics, OK? I'm just like, I'm not a robotics lady. I know some people are super into it. I don't know. I just had, like, I don't know. I'm just not a robots person. But I really, really like wearable electronics, right? So. Right. We do a lot of wearable technologies, and I think there should be like a hacker or maker or wearable electronics club in like every high school, just an after-school club where they get together and sew up LEDs and sensors into their clothing. And I'll, I'll show off some demos later. Uh, because you can build really cool fashion, really cool technologies. So having more options, because there's some people who are going to look at first and be like, well, I don't want to make like a battle robot. Like it's just not into, they're not into it. I don't know. Like, it's not their... There's so much electronics, they're not into it. Maybe they want to do audio electronics. They want, they want to make stereo systems. Or they want to build their own cell phone. Or they want to, you know, I don't know what projects you guys do in the fuse box. But they want to see more in different things. Um, so it's not, I, I don't think that this is at all uh, trying to replace or, you know, it, 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 that you can't go into a school that already has first. I think that you should go to schools that have, that have first and show them here's even more stuff you can do without right. maybe joining a robotics club. Right. Right, definitely. I mean, I think, you, actually, you were talking about wearables, and, and we know, it, actually, Adafruit's lily pad is something that we're really interested in integrating, um, because kids get really excited when they see, you know, here's lights, here's something we've just made blink. We, we usually start with, you know, here's how you blink an LED, and that's yeah. super exciting, you know, for people who are like, you know, that's a light bulb, this is a light bulb, now it's blinking. Yeah. Um, and then to be able to say, well, now I have this LED, you know, we can have that in your clothes. We, one of the things that we ask kids at the end um, is, if you could build anything, what would you build? Um, what do they want to build? 
We've gotten crazy answers. Okay. Um, I think we, we've had one kid say uh, he wanted to build an electronics tomato truck to distribute tomatoes, which were his favorite food. That's um, a very good idea. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm with it. I, yeah, like a little robot, <laughs> and you put ketchup on it, and it like, you know, like goes down ketchup delivery, beep, beep. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. that's a lot of electronics involved in ketchup delivery. You need servos <laughs> and stepper motors <laughs> and PC motors, and you need some way to grip onto the ketchup bottle or, like, to hold the tomato, and you have to hold it gently. So you need feedback technology so you don't squish and bruise your tomatoes. There's nothing grosser than a bruised tomato. You want them to be, like, perfectly red and round. Uh, <laughs> it's good that you're getting these ideas from kids. And so when you go to the truck, you, you have them come up with, now that you've seen this tilt sensor or this LED, what would you do? Right. I mean, that's exactly it. You know, we start with them having, you know, dreaming wildly and, and thinking the craziest things. And then, you know, in putting together these little parts, you can see it's becoming clear to them, you know, if I wanted to build that, this is what I would do. This Ooh. is not something that's impossible. I can actually begin to think about how I would really make that happen. And I think that's what Fusebox is all about, letting okay. them dream big and say, how can we make that happen? And, and what's, what's your moonshot in relation to this? Yeah, so... On the, moon, on the moonshot topic, what is this... How's this moonshotty? Yeah, so I mean, I think that's that's exactly what it is. Um, we want to take kids who we want to reach everybody. So anybody who you know is interested in hacking to kids who have no idea what hacking means to let them believe that they can build anything, um, and then show them that they can do that. That's so cool. All right, have you have you already uh, gotten some kids who are like, I wanted to y you know be a singer or like a rock star, but now I want to be an electrical engineer or mechanical engineer? Yeah, we actually had, so we, we worked with our first class, um, we worked with kids from grade 7 to grade 12. Uh, and it turns out there's a huge difference between kids in grade 7 and grade 12. Um, but we had this high school student who had no intention of, of studying um, engineering. And she said, you know, I've actually seen an Arduino before. A friend I had in school showed me this. Um, and he was trying to explain to me what it was, and it seemed so complicated. I decided right then and there I would never look at one of these again. Um, and so she, she, she took the class on a whim um, because we, we advertised that we would be making a gumball machine. Um, and so she joined it and she said, you know, after I've taken this, I, I thought it was something so difficult, but I realized it's something so accessible and so simple. And, and yeah. she wanted to know where she could buy one. And we referred her to the Arduino website. We referred her to the Radio Shack. Um, and, and that's our goal, to say, you know, people who have either seen this before or have never seen this technology, and it's, it's, it's magic to them. And to say, you know, this is not magic. This is something you can build, and you can make that happen. What I think is interesting about um, both your approach, Catherine, and your approach, Aya, I hopefully is still awake uh, <laughs> with us. Hello. OK. Uh, is that what's interesting is that there's always been people who are like, well, I want to teach electronics, or I want to teach engineering. And from historically, from what I've seen, how, like, pre, like, 2005 or so, how pre-2005 people were teaching electronics and engineering was always from a very bottom-up uh, <laughs> technique. Like you're um, at Stanford right now, Catherine, mm -hmm. and um, I, you went to MIT, and I, you know, I also went to MIT. And MIT and Stanford, I imagine, almost every engineering school, these are the only schools I know of how they do it, they always start with like, well, here's like the linear algebra equation, and then here's the differential equation, the calculus, and then here's one electron. Okay, we're going to model this one electron, and then like, oh no, you can't get to multiple electrons until you're like a junior, right? And then you're a junior, and they're like, now we have like infinite electrons. You just jump, jump straight from one to infinite. And then like maybe by senior year, they're like, this is how a transistor works. Right? <laughs> maybe, if you're lucky. Like sing, it's a single transistor, or how like to, you know, you go through all this math and this modeling, which is excellent stuff, right? It's it's beautiful, it's so elegant. Maxwell's equation, everybody loves them, but it's it's really a little traumatic to dump that on a kid, right? It's like you're a seventh grader and you're like, okay, well first, like imagine like an infinite ball that's surrounding <laughs> the the wire, and you're like, okay, it's over, right? Like they, <laughs> it, it's so complicated, but when you go to them and you say, here is a DIY gumball machine, or here is a little bit's kit, and you can make your own electric guitar. And after that, they're they're done with this project. Then maybe you say, well, here is the theory behind what you just did, right? It's not as scary. It's a lot more fun, a lot more interesting because I think that's how people learn. That's how we want to learn, right? We don't um, learn to cook just because like we want to understand like you know the science behind how eggs cook. We want we want to cook because we want to eat those eggs. 
right? The, the goal is the, is the point. And uh, so that's why I like about both of your approaches because it's, it's really hands-on, it's really friendly, and you don't have to know a lot of like math and science beforehand. So if you were scared off by this stuff, because sometimes you know, by fifth grade you're already off of the math track and you're not taking the AP classes, you can sort of feel like it's too late for me, right? I didn't take you know, physics three, so can I even do any of this mechanical engineering? Can I ever understand electronics? So the answer is, yeah, you can. Uh, you know, and so that's, I think that's really great. And uh, I think you both are doing so much to help people learn about electronics of all ages, not just uh, young people or not just women or not just men or, you know, not just anybody. It's like all people of all walks of life love to build stuff. Everyone's creative. And with that in mind, let's look at some creative demos that you guys have to show. So Aya, you're still with us. Let's see some so, projects you can build a little bit. What can you make? All right, so I'm going to start, even though you said not a robotics gal, I'm going to start with a robotics I project. Know, I know, look, I just have a soft spot for it, but I understand. <laughs> Everyone else loves robots. Robots are fun because uh, sometimes people think, um, especially people who are very um, familiar with electronics, they think that either electronics are about just transistors and circuits that are on the, um, or these robots are just these unattainable things that you have to be an engineer or a roboticist to do. So uh, we've been trying to make more and more of these like hyper engaging and really sophisticated robots, but super simple always to get mm -hmm. so that you can get excited. So. This is, um, we actually just yesterday launched a new kit um, okay. that was uh, uh, incidentally with this, um, uh, with this uh, segment called Moonshot. It's a oh, partnership yeah, with Moonshot. Moonshot. Everybody drink. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, so, um, it's, so since this is Moonshot, it's a kit that we did in partnership with NASA. Um, and the goal was to break down space and Earth exploration and make it accessible and understandable to everybody so that you can make your own Mars rover, you can make your own satellite, you can make your own ISS and transmit music to it wirelessly. So the demo that I have is actually of this Mars rover. Um, oh, so cute. <laughs> Um, so it's really cute. It's it's basically made of little bits that's attached to some uh, wheels, some wheels and tracks from Tamiya. Um, it's a grabber. So I'm gonna let's see if I can figure this out here. Okay. And then on this side, I have my remote pole, and each of these dimmers is controlling. Two of them are controlling a, a left motor and a right motor, and the middle one is controlling this. Um, I don't know what it's called. The grabber, I grabber, guess. So, yeah. Grab it. So I'm going to show you how here. Let me try okay. to do this. Okay, grab it. So the, yeah. So the grabber. Let's. See, I'm going to do. I'm going to go forward first. Now I can go forward. I can decide to go right. I can decide to go left instead. I can crash into the screen, and then okay. I can decide to grab something. And so suddenly you're doing. This is wireless communication. There's obviously complex um, uh, uh, programming on each of the chips, but the goal is, like you said, you care about making that little grabber robot, or in this case, a Mars rover, you about how Mars rover is gathering sensor data, how it's moving around in Mars, and how we're controlling it wirelessly. That's and this is another little demo that yeah, I'll show. Yeah, what's that? So this is fun. This is a satellite dish, and it's uh, we do it. Uh, we made it to illustrate the concept of how satellite dishes um, are are gathering uh, signals and basically focusing the signals on a focal point and then measuring it. So I'll open it here in the back. And like that's the other thing. Why c do electronics have to be ugly? We care a lot about making them beautiful. So yeah, your stuff always so looks so great. I love this. So this is our satellite dish. So you can see here we have a light sensor here, which I don't know if you can see. There's a light yeah. sensor. We have an LED here that's mimicking uh, these signals that you're beaming. Um, and then the dimmer on this side is adjusting where my hand. The dimmer on this side is adjusting the light that you're sending in. And what you can see here, the cool part, is that you can the sensor is gathering more or less light depending on how much you're focusing on it. And so this is what it looks like in the front. These are some great sure projects. I love and then some of the ones that... Oh, sorry. Yeah, this is fun. You know, actually, um, so a lot of these projects that I came up with, we sat with them and we were like, what's some of the coolest things in engineering that's happening at NASA? And there's so many incredible things, but oftentimes we, we, the public doesn't know, and, and, and we think it's just 
space uh, uh, program is shut down and NASA's passe, and that's not true. There's so many exciting things happening, and so we want to make them engaging for whether uh, engaging for kids, but at the same time scientifically accurate and and still sort of rare science that adults are dealing with. I love this. Is like this is like you make it. You're making engineering so easy. Even a rocket engineer can do it. Uh, okay, thank you so much for showing off those those lovely projects. And you guys have like hundreds of projects on the Little Bits website, right? Like thousands. Yeah, so we have this Instructable-like platform uh, that's on the Little Bits website uh, where literally uh, we and the community keeps up in projects. So anything from uh, wearables to robots to installations uh, to products to learning materials and lessons. Uh, and so there's thousands of them. And right now we have a lot of these NASA ones, but we also have some that are music around the synth kit. We have a lot that are related um, to sort of simple electronics. Um, and, and literally, it keeps growing. So it's a growing and, library. That's that's the goal. And then uh, finally, what is what what is something that the community can do to help you achieve your moonshot with little bits? Actually, I have a, a, a my my um, my community request uh, applies to cat. Catherine specifically, but also everybody that's listening, uh, which is we're looking for more people to help us run workshops around the country, around the world, uh, with little bits to help introduce more people to electronics and to get them to make um, a lot of other things as well. Uh, but um, but but so many requests and we get so much interest and we just can't be everywhere. So we need the community to help us run their own uh, space, uh, hacker events, hackathons, um, uh, their own workshops, their classes, and we will support uh, by giving discounts and extra products and giving instructions, but we just can't be everywhere. Right, you need to come up with the little bits DNA cloning kit next. So you <laughs> can be everywhere. All right, that awesome, Aya. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, Catherine, I know that you were saying earlier that with Fusebox, you guys are um, start going to do a Kickstarter or other crowdsourcing. So, tell yeah. us about that. Yeah, that's right. Um, so, obviously, one of the biggest barriers when we're trying to, you know, bring Arduinos and you know bring sensors to everybody. And I know you were saying how you know the thing about Arduinos is that they really come down in price. It's really accessible. Um, but to really eliminate that final barrier, you know, we don't want the students that we work with to have to purchase those electronics to start. Um, and so electronics are kind of expensive. Um, and we're actually going to be running our Kickstarter. We're going to be starting it. Um, we're looking to start on May 17th, which is where we'll be at the Bay Area Maker Fair. Okay. Um, so that's when our uh, when the Fusebox Kickstarter will go live. Um, and we would love to have as much support as we can get so that um, that will be funding um, our truck, that will be funding gas, and that will be funding as much equipment as we can get. So, so what is something that the community at large can help you with your, your moonshot with Fusebox supporting your Kickstarter? Yeah, so if anybody, um, you know, just like any Kickstarter, we're going to be offering, you can, you know, you can donate in a wide range of tiers. And if we could have the community um, help support us through that Kickstarter, um, spreading the word, that would be awesome. Okay, I will totally support you and spread the word. So. Woo! Got your back. All right. Awesome, Catherine. You should show one demo. Oh, yeah. And I'm going to show off one demo. <laughs> I want to show off uh, this uh, really cool glowing umbrella project. Thank you, kind assistant. Uh, this is a, we're, we're interested here at Adafruit in designing electronics so that people can build wearable and other uh, kind of portable electronics that are fun. And, and I love robots. They're great. But um, uh, also stuff that's not just robots. And so this is. Uh, a, one of those clear umbrellas that you see on the street you can see through. And we've updated it to include a Flora microcontroller, which is kind of like an Arduino, and these uh, LED strips, and then a, a battery pack, and then I can turn it on. And it's like a, it's like a rainbow umbrella. So we call it the Flora umbrella. So this is great for uh, going outside, looking cool, and uh, staying visible. <laughs> and seeing where you're going. Yeah, I'm going to be under this, under this dome. <laughs> um, okay, cool. Are there any other uh, questions from the audience that if yeah, you want to answer? Okay, QA up. So, okay, Catherine, you're up first. I love what you're doing. Are there any plans to scale it large? And if so, how would you go about that? That's from Lydia. Awesome. Well, Lydia, um, so we actually want to start pretty small, and then we would love to make this, um, you know, as large as it can get. So. Uh, because we're working in this mobile format, one thing that that is really awesome for is it allows us to reach as many schools as we can in the area. We're not fixed in any one school. 
Um, and so we really want to, you know, we've been prototyping our classes, we've tested it out with our first group of students, and we're hopefully going to be teaching a whole bunch of workshops at Maker Fair. Um, and then if this does work, we would love to expand to other communities and to, to help them organize something similar. Um, so that they can have that same mobile hacker space to reach, you know, all the students in, in that area along the same lines. So we will be definitely posting all of our curriculums, um, posting, you know, where those materials can get, for, uh, where those materials can be gotten from, uh, a, a supply list of what we'll be using. So we do want to make that something that will be replicable in any kind of community. Oh, I can't wait. I mean, a kid is so cool right now. Like, to have the like, maker spaces and first and trucks and ice cream and Arduinos. Okay, next up we have a Tomato. question. Oh, sorry, what'd you say? Tomato. Tomato, Tomato, <laughs> Tomato trucks. Uh, next up we have a question uh, for you, Aya, from Abby. Where can I find examples of inventions that are built with little bits and, and or Adafruit? So you can find them on both the Little Bits and the Adafruit website. Um, actually, we've had a bunch of people that have hacked together Little Bits and Adafruit components as well. Um, and it's really nice to see people reinventing and kind of recreating, and combining with Lego, with Kinects, with Arduino, all sorts of things. So um, for our link is littlebits.cc slash projects. You could also find stuff on dy.org and on Instructables. There's a lot of stuff too. For Adafruit projects, we have everything documented on our learning system, which is learn.adafruit.com, and we have like 500 different projects, uh, all sorts of different electronic projects, wearable projects, yeah, robotics projects, or why not, uh, you know, uh, sensor tutorials, all sorts of stuff. Hopefully some of that will make it into the Fusebox curriculum as well, because we, we publish everything that we know about electronics online. Um, let's see, are there any other questions? Okay, sounds like... We got all the questions taken care of. Uh, do you guys have any quick questions you want to ask each other? I have one. Sure. How can we help you at Adafruit? How can the community help you to help you achieve your moonshot? Oh, yeah. Sorry. That's right. I totally like left myself. I was so excited by talking to Catherine and Aya. Um, one of the best things that you can do to, to help Adafruit and help me with my goal of teaching everybody about electronics and showing how cool it is, is uh, to, you know, if you know electronics, you know engineering, or you're curious about it, meet up with somebody young that you know and show them what it's like to, you know, build a kit, maybe get an Arduino together and learn together, do it together so you both learn from each other because, uh, for, you know, as we've heard, uh, kids can be surprisingly creative in their tomato truck uh, technologies. And so, you know, you as an adult um, may learn a lot from the kid, the kid may learn a lot from you. I think by doing it together, we show that uh, electronics and engineering is intergenerational. Uh, and people of all ages and types love to build stuff. Can I ask one more? This one's for Catherine, if you don't mind. Yeah, go for it. So um, I, we at Google, so I work with both Solve4x and the Google for Education team. So we know Catherine because of the Google Science Fair. Um, and I just want to make a quick plug that the deadline for entering the Google Science Fair for this year is coming up in a few weeks. And I wonder if we could get Catherine to talk for just real quick about her Google Science Fair experience and what her project was and share that with this community as well. Go yeah. for it. Um, yeah. I, so I entered Google Science Fair. I actually entered it twice. Um, and then I ended up going down to Mountain View, which was awesome, um, a, a couple of years ago. And so uh, the project that I worked on was building wireless diagnostic tools that could work with phones um, that were actually targeted for patients in the developing world and taking something like an EKG or a stethoscope and actually trying to build that so that would be really, really inexpensive um, and could be interfaced with cell phones because one thing um, that I don't know how, how prevalent or, or how well known it is is that cell phones are extremely prevalent in the developing world. Actually, almost um, Oh, there's a huge majority of people, even in India, I think there's actually more cell phones than toilets. Um, so to be able to build something that works on that platform is, is really helpful and allows them to reach, you know, to almost dial out of their own situation and reach uh, physicians who are, who are farther away than where they are and to reach, you know, even if there's no local medical care, um, to find medical care elsewhere. And so I would definitely encourage any kind of student um, who's interested in research, who's been working on a project, to apply to Google Science Fair. It was an incredible experience. Um, I think more than that, you you know you come to Google, but you also meet another group of kids who are so interested in, in building technologies and really from all over the world. Um, uh, so, and I, I'm definitely still in touch with those kids today. You you see them everywhere. You you follow them doing awesome things. I think a, a kid from this year's Google Science Fair is actually 
downstairs at our Stanford Admit Weekend today. Um, so it's awesome. It's incredible. Okay. Wow, this was a, a, the most fun half hour I've had in quite a long time. Thank you, Google, for hosting us uh, and Solve for X as well. And of course, thank you to Aya and to Catherine for uh, hanging out with us and talking. And Tracy, sorry, of course. And Tracy, who's quiet, who I almost forgot about, uh, for um, hosting and visiting us on this lovely Solve for X Moonshot Madness. No, it was just called the end Moonshot Hangout. Moonshot. Uh, what? Moonshot Meetup. Moonshot Meetup. I was close. I mean, Very close. Cool. Cool. Moonshot yeah. Madness. I think Moonshot Madness. madness. Yeah. <laughs> uh, only, only in March. Sorry. Um, and uh, you guys will be doing more of these, right? When's the next one? Do you have a date? The next one is coming up in early May, so stay tuned on the Solve for X G Plus page. Um, we've got some exciting folks doing really neat things in agriculture in Africa, so it'll be really fun. All right. Awesome. All right. Thank you, everybody. And uh, see you guys in May. All right. Bye.